The WWDC 23 keynote just ended and we saw three new Macs announced. The 15 inch MacBook Air, the M2 Max or M2 Ultra powered Mac Studio and the all new Mac Pro. While there are no real chip advancements outside of the M2 Ultra in those machines, there are a few things I think are worth discussing. Some are obvious and some are a lot more subtle, but I think are still important to consider. Today, I wanna to dive into the keynote a little bit and focus on the new Macs because they're gonna be available right away. And with people making purchasing decisions, I'd like to just give my thoughts on what those machines look like from a distance as compared to the models before them. If you're looking at any of these models to purchase or you just want to compare event notes, stick around and let's get into it. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. The new Mac announcements were all pretty predictable this year to some extent. I think we all knew the 15 inch Air was coming and that we'd see an updated Mac Studio and likely a Pro machine as well. Those were rumored to get updates and it just logically made sense given Apple's release cycle. But having said that, there were some changes brought up that sat outside of those machines in the current Mac lineup. The 13 inch MacBook Air went down $100 to $1099, which I believe is worth mentioning because the M1 Air stayed at $999, which for me just makes this more of a no-brainer for picking up the M2 Air over the M1. You do get a little bit better chip performance in the M2 Air, but throwing that aside, you get a better, brighter screen, MagSafe charging, and a nicer keyboard. The 15-inch MacBook Air is pretty much the same thing as the 13-inch M2 Air, with the base model starting at $1299, which for me is a pretty decent price given what you get. I thought that this would just be the same base specs as the 13-inch iteration, but there are a couple of interesting differences. You'll notice the 13-inch model starts with an 8 8-core CPU and 8-core GPU, where the 15-inch starts with the 8-core CPU and 10-core GPU. Really, when you set that option, if you're buying the 13-inch model, that's only $100 difference for the extra screen real estate in the 15-inch. The new Air also has a six-speaker sound system with force-canceling woofers, which the 13-inch doesn't have, and it only has four speakers. Now, for those that don't know what force-canceling woofers are, they're essentially woofers that fire in opposite directions from each other within your machine that are supposed to create balance and eliminate vibrations, and in theory should make the audio sound better, but we'll have to wait and see. Now I have already ordered the 15 inch Air and the new M2 Max Mac Studio as well for the channel. So if you wanna see a comparison between the 13 inch model and this one, or you just wanna check out the new Mac Studio, just make sure that you're subscribed and I should have more content on the way regarding those. Anyway, I think those were a couple of things that I noticed with the 15 inch MacBook Air. The other specs are pretty much identical to the 13 inch, same camera, same screen, brightness and battery life. I was kind of wondering if the battery life would be any better considering it is a tad bigger and weighs in at 3.3 pounds versus 2.7 that's on the 13 inch, which is still ridiculously light. It's also just a hair thicker than the smaller version at 1.15 centimeters where the 13 inch was at 1.13. So really likely not visually distinguishable at all. It will be interesting to see if there is any difference to heat dissipation having that larger surface area with a fanless design. They advertise it as the world's thinnest 15 inch laptop and Apple seemed to really push the M2 Air towards PC users and non-Apple users, which was messaging that was present throughout the keynote. They rolled through the advantages in all these different areas where the Air would best PC laptops and the one thing that I thought was kind of different is they seem to specifically target people who aren't at all familiar with Apple and did a little ecosystem demo. They definitely seem to be treating the 15 inch Air as an entry point for new Mac users, so I'll be curious to see how that plays out. That PC user messaging was there to a lesser extent with the Mac Studio where there seemed to be more of a direct comparison with its M1 predecessor. We kind of know what to expect performance-wise out of the M2 Max chip because it's already in the MacBook Pro. You can find benchmarks online and video comparisons already, but they did go over how much faster it is. Messaging like M2 Max is 50% faster with After Effects renders or 25% faster compile times on M2 Max over M1 Max and so on. One thing I do suspect we'll see is lower SSD speeds on the base version of the Mac Studio with the 512 gig SSD, just like we did on the MacBook Pro, but I am very excited to test this out in some real world comparisons versus the M2 Pro Mac Mini that I have, just to see what performance looks like between the two. The M2 Pro Mini that I bought with an upgraded SSD and upgraded RAM comes in at $1899, which was $100 cheaper than the base studio 
And compared with the 2022 Mac Studio did have some advantages people would notice every day like Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.3. Wi-Fi 6E in all of my testing has been much faster than Wi-Fi 6, but now that the Mac Studio has both 6E and Bluetooth 5.3, the difference between a spec out mini and the studio is a lot less. And I don't know that it'll make sense to pick up a mini with an M2 Pro any longer. There are a few other things to note with a new studio that best both last year's model and the MacBook Pro with the M2 Max that we haven't seen in any other machines yet. It has better monitor support than both of those models with support for up to five simultaneous displays, four 6K displays at 60 Hertz on Thunderbolt and one 4K monitor at 60 Hertz over HDMI. On the surface, that sounds the same as last year, but it'll also get boosted HDMI specs where you'll be able to get 8K resolution or 4K at 240 Hertz on a single monitor, which the M1 Max can't do. So for those of you who want to drive a single 8K monitor at 60 Hertz, a 4K monitor that has a higher refresh rate than 60 Hertz, you can do that on the new Mac Studio without having to use up one of your Thunderbolt ports. Now, the real upgrade in terms of display support is when you get into the M2 Ultra, and that's where things get kind of wild. There's simultaneous display support for up to eight monitors, so eight 4K monitors at 60 Hertz, six displays with 6K resolution, or three displays with 8K resolution. I'm not sure who has a display set up like that, but the craziness with this chip doesn't stop at display support. You can get up to a 24 core CPU and 76 core GPU where the M1 maxed out at a 20 core CPU and 60 four core GPU. And now you can get a whopping 192 gigs of RAM, which is an increase of 50% over the M1 Ultra. There's very little real world info on these chips right now, but Apple says the processing speed is supposed to be 20% faster on the CPU and 30 on the GPU. And the neural engine is 40% faster. The Mac Pro, the final Mac that they announced has a lot of the same features that the M2 Ultra Studio has, but they did bring up other use cases like video transcoding and 3D simulation. And this is likely aimed mostly at audio and video pros who need the use of external cards. Like I said, the same M2 Ultra chip, but the new Mac Pro has seven PCIe Gen 4 slots, so the first Apple Silicon machine that allows you to actually add on to the internals of the machine outside of the system on the chip. But it is somewhat limited in that you can't just bolt a GPU onto these as those are incompatible. It's more so gonna be used for things like audio cards and video input and output. There's also eight Thunderbolt 4 ports, the most out of any Mac, two HDMI ports and two USB-A ports. I mean, it's definitely a beast and it does start at a whopping $7,000, but I don't think this is a tool that too many people actually actually need, which is why I think we'll leave it at that. I did want to briefly mention some of the other things discussed outside of these machines. As far as software goes, not a whole lot worth mentioning in my opinion. Lots of widget related stuff on all the different platforms and a lot of things most folks likely won't ever use. One thing that did pique my interest was a mention of AirDrop working over a regular network connection. That could be kind of cool. And the thing that I'm most pumped for in iOS 17, Apple will now remember swear words that you type in, which I think we all need more of in our lives. Just one want to type a ducking word. But really, outside of that, when you start referring to running multiple timers as living in an age of wonders or talking about planet wallpapers, things are likely a little light on new software features. As far as the Apple Vision Pro, we're not going to see that for a while, and I don't really want to comment on it too much until I actually see one in person. But lots of neat features are packed in it for sure, and I was fascinated with some of the smaller things like the optical inserts, which seem really cool, but that's more of a wait and see for me. That's really all I wanted to touch on today, I more so just wanted to go over some of the new specs that maybe got mentioned or glossed over for anyone considering buying these machines, but feel free to drop a comment down below and share any info on these models or just chat about your favorite things that came out of WWDC 23. If you enjoyed this video or you found it useful, hitting that thumbs up button would be appreciated. If you want to see more tech related content or dine with me in a luxurious restaurant and attempt to eat spaghetti with chopsticks, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload. Oh,